cultural events along with partnered and supported events, trips and classes. For a full list of everything, um, you can find that on our website, politics-pros.com. Um, before we get started today, I'd just like you to please silence your cell phones so as not to disrupt the event or turn them off. And when we get time to opening the floor to your questions, we've placed a standing microphone just here at the front. Um, so when it comes to the questions, if you can line up to the right of this pillar here and be sure to speak into the microphone um, as we are video recording today's program. So you or anyone you can know, find it on the Politics and Pros YouTube channel. Following the Q&A, we'll have a sign up here at this table. So if you've not already purchased the book, uh, we have plenty of copies behind our registers at the front of the store. Again, we'll ask you to line up to the right of this pillar here, and we'll come by and ask your name for any personalizations. So please have the book ready. Once the event is complete, um, we just ask you if you can help us out a bit, fold up your chairs and um, lean them up against something sturdy. Okay, so without further ado, um, we're very excited to welcome Raja Shahadi, as well as Palestine's leading writer, Shahadi is also a lawyer and the founder of the pioneering Palestinian human rights organization, Al Haq. He's the author of several acclaimed books, including Strangers in the House, Occupation Diaries, and Palestinian Walks, which won the prestigious Orwell Prize. His latest is a memoir that delves into the complex relationship he had with his father, as well as recounting the story of the battle against the various oppressors, reminding of the threat to freedom and democracy exacted by such forces. Tonight's event is in partnership with the Museum of the Palestinian People. Um, it's a very moving little museum between DuPont and Adams Morgan. Um, they also have a Middle Eastern bookstore next door to that, so you can check out that out for your Middle Eastern books and also for your Zatar spices. So if you'd join me in welcoming Rajar Shahada. politics and prose and the Museum of the Palestinian People for hosting this event. I will start by reading from the book, uh, from the very beginning of the book, for from the few pages, and then I will present the book and uh, do a little more reading, and, uh, and that would be uh, my role uh, before the few we questions. Can't hear. We can't hear. We can't we can't hear. Hear. Now, now is it better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I could hear him entering the office with his usual gusto. As always, he took a deep, I took a deep breath when my father came in. He stopped at the reception to get the latest messages, then asked, has anyone called? With small quick steps thumping the ground, he walked past my room, followed by his secretary, to whom he, had already, he was already dictating letters concerning the day's court hearings. He was wearing a dark suit with a well-ironed white shirt and a black tie and carrying his heavy black leather briefcase. Then he doubled back and peered through the open door to my, to, into my room. He saw me looking over a map covered in cobweb lines and asked accusingly, what are you doing? Don't you have any work to do? Before I could explain, he had darted into his office to resume dictating. I stayed in my office examining the new 1984 military order plus the attached map that my father had seen with me. Road plan number 50, as it was designated, was the blueprint for the Israeli occupation authority's long-term objective of creating a new West Bank road network that was bound to have a devastating effect on the Palestinian landscape on traditional towns and villages and on the agricultural areas. 
studying it, I could see where future roads were to be built, how the existing network of roads was to be altered from a north-south to east-west grid, and how the Jordan Valley was to get a new road, one that would better connect it to Israel and consolidate it as the country's eastern border. The implications were massive. I gave my father time to finish re dictating his letters. Then I walked over to his office to show him the new order and map, which had just only arrived in the post that day. When I suggested to him that we should submit objections to the proposal, he was not enthusiastic. He didn't seem to share my uh, sense of foreboding about the impact that the order would have on the land. The phone rang and he answered, Aziz Shadi here, how can I help you? Waving me away, he sank into a conversation with his client. But I continued to think about the new road plan. A few weeks earlier, I had taken a solitary drive w down what we called the Latrun Road, since it linked the hilly town of Ramallah to the coastal city of Jaffa via the Latrun Monastery. On both sides of the road, I could see terraced hills dotted with the olive trees in full leaf. The trees on the slopes of these undulating hills were all approximately the same height, and they were all olives. As I drove northwest, the hills were awash with sunlight, and the trees cast their shadows over the brown earth all the way down to the wadi. On the hill to my right was a plot that belonged to my client. He had just heard that the occupation authorities had expropriated it and were planning to establish Beit Haron and settle it with Israeli Jews. I couldn't understand why. What was the point of putting Israeli civilians in the midst of our hills so close to a Palestinian village? How could, how would these settlers get their electricity and water? They couldn't depend on the inadequate services from the nearby village. Could they possibly have plans for an alternative infrastructure, it was then that the worrying thought struck me like lightning. What if our Israeli occupiers were already, who already had total control of the network serving us, were proposing to construct a superior network of water, electricity, and roads connecting the settlements to Israel? That would mean that they could cut us off without affecting their own people we would be completely at their mercy for essential services. When I saw the military order amount, amounting, announcing the new road plan, I feared that the Israeli military was taking the first step to prepare the way for this eventuality. As you can gather from the reading, I was trying to uh, uh, recruit my father to, uh, to assist me in, in res resisting the consequences of the 1967 occupation. I was not aware then of his uh, role in uh, uh, resisting the effect of the Nekti of 1948. But this book is not only about the resistance. This book is not only about the resistance to the occupation and uh, our mutual uh, work on resisting the uh, occupation and the 48 uh, effects of the 48. It's also a book on the uh, complicated and challenging father-son relationship. As I was preparing to write the book, a friend of mine brought me a copy of the Palestine uh, tel telephone directory of Jaffa, Tel Aviv, dated January 1944. There I found my father's name and my grandfather's name, uh, Judge Salim uh, Shahadi. Emotion overwhelmed me. All that history of their life in Jaffa had been denied, and all the uh, uh, work of my father in politics has been erased. This was the catalyst that had started me thinking about father's legacy and work. I was slowly getting ready to open that cabinet that kept my father's files. In the final years of his uh, life, my f I saw my father preparing to put his uh, documents in order and uh, plan uh, to put them in files and uh, uh, index them and so on. 
And after his death, uh, they stayed in my father's, in my mother's uh, house, and I didn't want to look at them. My mother kept telli telling me, why don't you come and take them away? And I said, no, I don't want, I have my own life to live and my own cabinets to fill, and I don't want to get involved with my father's affairs. And then, uh, uh, after uh, years, uh, somebody brought me a copy of uh, a little booklet that my father had written in 1936 called The Arab Case, The ABC of the Arab Case for Palestine. I looked at that uh, uh, little booklet and saw how well it was written and how clearly it put uh, uh, the case and I thought my father had done lots of work that I need to look at. And then I started opening that cabinet and there I found uh, tremendous uh, uh, documents and and uh, and uh, files that uh, had all all his work and so on. Uh, my father uh, was forced out of Jaffa in 1948. He was expecting to return, and his expectation to return was due to the fact that the uh, uh, partition sc scheme of 1947 had left Jaffa in the Arab se section of the. Uh, the Arab state. And so he expected that if the worst happens and Palestine is partitioned, uh, he, Jaffa would remain in the Arab <coughs> side and he would be able to return. Uh, and then his hopes were raised in December 11, 1948, when the UN passed Resolution 194, which stated that refugees wishing to return should be permitted to return and compensation should be paid for those choosing not to return. And at the same time, after the resolution, uh, the Palestine Conciliation Commission, which is also a UN body, was established to carry out the resolution uh, 194. Uh, my father thought that uh, uh, they need to, the uh, refugees need to organize themselves, and so he and others uh, established the refugee uh, congress uh, called the Ramallah Refugee Congress, which had 300,000 300, members. And of course, that was very difficult at that time to, to have uh, such a, a big organization. And then uh, in 1948, uh, the Congress was invited to represent the Palestinians in Lausanne, in Switzerland. And uh, uh, they chose a committee of three, which my father was one of, to go to Lausanne to present the case. In Lausanne, Israel said that it, was o it would only negotiate with states, and the Palestinians were not a state, so they would not negotiate with them. And this was not the first, nor will it be the last time that the, Palest that the Israel rejected uh, the offer with of Palestinians to negotiate peace with it. Unbeknown to my father, secret negotiations were taking place in 1947 between uh, King Abdullah of Jordan, East Jordan, and the Zionists. Uh, and, uh, and in February 48, Ernst Bevin, the foreign minister of uh, Britain, uh, gave the green line to King Abdullah to snatch any territory not allotted to the, to the by partition to the Jews. So uh, they were uh, working together to make sure that no Palestinian state would be established and that uh, Jordan would be expanded uh, by taking the parts of uh, the Palestine which were outside the partition scheme uh, for the, Jew uh, the land for the Jews. Uh, it's 75 years since, since that uh, uh, event, the uh, uh, throwing out of the Palestinians out of the land, and still there's no recognition of the Nakba or recognition of the right of return. And uh, that experience was a tremendously painful experience for the Palestinians and put them in great despair. And I think that uh, uh, they were shocked by the fact that the small uh, Jewish mi minority could uh, force them out of that land. And I think it was a question of failure of imagination. Uh, they didn't, and, and an experiential uh, gap between the two sides. The uh, Jews were, uh, had witnessed the Holocaust and were affected by the Holocaust, and the Palestinians had no uh, in, in, uh, idea that they would be, uh, uh, the Jews would be able to 
uh, throw them out. I think this is similar to the f what is happening in the West Bank, where we also in the West Bank had no, uh, uh, ima couldn't imagine that the uh, uh, Israelis would be able to uh, build uh, settlements and uh, uh, bring in uh, over half a million Jews to, 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 the, Pal to the West Bank and uh, uh, in such, such a short period of time. A prominent Israeli uh, novelist has said that the uh, creation of Israel was a miracle. And I think that it was no miracle at all, because as uh, uh, the archives now show, the gap between the uh, power of the military power of the Zionists and the Palestinians was so large in favor of the uh, Zionists that uh, it was inevitable that they would win. And the only miracle is that Israel was able to uh, uh, throw out most of the people of the, Palest of the land, and that 50 years have passed, 75 years have passed, and still no recognition of what has happened then. That is the real miracle, I think. In, in the uh, cabinet that I opened after three, uh, many years, uh, I found many other files which are very important. And one of them was a file of the Parkley's Bank case, which my father had taken and won. And that was the case of uh, the uh, uh, fact that uh, Israel, after it was established, had closed the, uh, frozen the accounts of the Palestinians who had uh, uh, accounts in, in Arab Bank and uh, branches and Barclays Bank branches in Israel. And, and they would not allow them to withdraw their money out, uh, out of these accounts uh, from outside. And, uh, and so uh, the idea was that uh, they wanted to make beggars out of the uh, Palestinians who had lost everything in the course of the war. And uh, uh, the idea was no country, uh, no money, no country. Uh, my father took a case against the Barclays Bank in the district court in, in Jerusalem uh, under Jordan, and uh, he uh, won the case, and the bank had to pay. Now, uh, in uh, 1984, uh, uh, he had to go to London to work out the procedure for the uh, distribution of the money. And uh, there he, uh, uh, there he, uh, uh, after he finished that uh, negotiation with them, the uh, foreign, uh, uh, the uh, Jordanian foreign minister wrote a letter that uh, uh, was published, and he said that uh, Aziz Shahadi had negotiated with Israel, and this is tantamount to treason. And uh, so, uh, all the w along the borders of uh, Jordan, uh, an arrest warrant was put so that when he returns, he would be arrested. Uh, so as a result, he had to spend 27 months in exile uh, between London, uh, Rome, and Beirut. And uh, we were left alone in, in Ramallah uh, with little means, of with little money, and with, without our uh, father. And uh, while he was in London, he uh, managed to write a memo uh, to the British Parliament against Glob Pasha. And Glob Pasha is John Begut Glob, who was known in Jordan as Glob Pasha, and who uh, was uh, uh, torturing uh, the Palestinians and uh, 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 acting as a, uh, in very harsh uh, w ways to anyone who, who raised their heads against the regime in Jordan. When I think of him writing this memo against the uh, Glob Pasha, I think uh, that uh, how could he have imagined that uh, the British would, would be amenable to uh, removing their agent in Jordan just because my father had uh, written about, uh, about him th this uh, memo. And, and the fact also that he was returning to Jordan ev eventually and be under this uh, harsh man's rule it was also uh, something that I thought was uh, fearless and maybe uh, too uh, naive. Uh, it is to be regretted that the case of the Barclays Bank 
which was a, a way of fighting Israel through the law, was not celebrated. Uh, and uh, it took many years before the uh, use of the law as a means for uh, fighting Israel uh, took root. And uh, it was 10 years after that, after the occupation, uh, at the start of the occupation, that uh, al-Haq was established. And I was, of course, uh, part of it. And al-Haq uh, tried to uh, use the law as a means for resisting the occupation. But unfortunately, the leadership, the Palestinian leadership outside did not take any notice of these changes in the law that we were uh, writing about and, and trying to uh, uh, stop. And uh, as a result, when the Oslo Accords uh, negotiations took place in, in 1993, uh, they didn't take any measures to notice of these military orders and changes in the law, and they didn't uh, reverse them. Uh, in 1958, there was another file which was very important also, which was in 1958, Abdul Karim Qasim uh, uh, was uh, killed in, in Baghdad, and, uh, and uh, he was the uncle of King Hussein. And King Hussein was fearful that in Jordan there would be also a coup. So he gathered all the uh, nationalists and anti-monarchists and put them in prison. Amongst these was my father. And the prison that he was taken to is called Al Jafar, which was a desert prison, which I visited uh, in, in order to uh, see the, the state of the place, in order to write about it. He stayed two months in Jafar, and these were very harsh months in the summer. And uh, when he came, I was trying to remember if, if I remembered his uh, return home, and I couldn't remember it. And I couldn't remember uh, that I uh, was f thinking of my father as a hero to have endured that uh, harshness and, and to have uh, stood up to the uh, injustice in Jordan. And I wondered why. And, uh, and the question of why I didn't have this uh, admiration to my father is a subject for, of this book. Uh, and in 1985, my father was murdered by a, a, a squatter who was in the land of the Anglican church in, in Bethlehem, in, in Hebron. And he was uh, uh, never investigated uh, because uh, he was probably an, a collaborator. I would like to, like to read to you what I wrote in the wake of this, uh, uh, my father's death. For years, I lived as a son whose world was ruled by a fundamentally benevolent father with whom I was temporarily fighting. I was sure that we were moving, always moving towards the ultimate happy family, and that one day we would all live in harmony. When he died before this could happen, I had to wake up from my fantasy, had to face the godlessness of my world and the fact that it is time bound. There was not enough time for the rebellion and the dream. The rebellion had consumed all the available time. I turned around to ask my stage manager when the second act would start and found that there was none. I was alone. There was no second act and no stage manager. What happened, what hadn't happened in the fa first act would never happen. Life moves in real time. But then I was in my prime, going full speed ahead with my human rights work thinking the world of myself. Having been a slow developer, I was beginning to feel able at long last to realize my potential and experience the young manhood that had been interrupted by the start of the Israeli occupation in 1967. I did not want anyone deterring me, stopping me in my tracks, or causing doubt, or casting doubt on the work I was so enthusiastically engaged in. I felt I was forging ahead, breaking what I believed then was new ground in the kind of legal resistance I was involved with against Israeli actions. I had no idea that my father had done the same years earlier, nor did I know that it was from him that I got my public spirit and the sense of responsibility that made me regard the failures of my people as a personal flaw for which I must bear the blame. 
it was this that motivated so many of my legal investigations into how Israel was pursuing the policies of the occupied territories and that pushed me to write all those articles and books to explain, to document, to advocate. After 1967, my father uh, changed and uh, he had, uh, he, he after his Jeff Jeff experience, he had decided that he would uh, stay away from politics and uh, he had another uh, child, my, my uh, young brother, and he stayed away from politics. But after 1967, he decided that it was not time anymore for passive uh, stance. And he uh, uh, visited Jaffa and saw that the Jaffa had not changed very much since he left it. Uh, and he uh, decided that it was time to negotiate peace with Israel. So he um, drafted a memorandum which he got 50 prominent people from the West Bank and Gaza to sign and presented it to the, to, to the Israeli government proposing a Palestinian state next to Israel and negotiations with Jerusalem as its, its capital with uh, negotiations for the uh, other pending issues. And he never, of course, got an answer from the, uh, from the Israelis. Uh, at that time, there were no settlements yet at all in the occupied territories. And it, it, uh, it would have been possible to do something like that, which now seems to be highly unlikely. It was in 1988 only that the PNC, that the Palestine National Council of the PLO, finally uh, agreed uh, to make a settlement based on uh, the uh, six, six borders of 1967. And, uh, and uh, it was by, by now, uh, and, and then in, in, the, uh, in the Oslo Accords, they didn't fa base this uh, proposal on the uh, uh, on the partition scheme, and in the so left they left the issues open for the borders, and in in the Oslo we saw that the uh, compromises were so big that uh, we have lost uh, a lot. Uh, so uh, the transformation of the land that my father had witnessed after 1948, from uh, changes from. Palestine, Palestine moving from uh, being Palestine into being Jordan mirrored the changes that I have witnessed uh, of the West Bank being turned into Israel. And yet, with all this, uh, I, we, we did not have, uh, we did not share, uh, we, did, we did not discuss this and, and uh, uh, realize that we had similar experiences. As I was finishing the book, an imaginary, an imaginary uh, uh, dialogue happened with my father, which I would like to read to you and finish with this. Now over half a century, I want to tell my father that history might, may have proven him wrong, that perhaps his, his was but an empty threat and Israel must have known it, the fact that he was telling them that if you don't make peace, the, the, the Palestinians who are a million uh, in, in the West Bank and Gaza would, would uh, be impossible, difficult to control. The occupier has seemingly won. The word occupation has been dropped from Israel's vocabulary. The curriculum taught in their schools tells their students that the whole of greater Israel is theirs and that the Palestinians have no rights over that land. I want to say to him, you underestimated Israel's power, resourcefulness, and long-term planning. And he answers, you say they've won, and you've, you cite the fact that they deny the Palestinians have any rights over the land and have dropped you from their consciousness. This means, this only means that they've uh, succeeded in deceiving you as well. You think that because they've made you invisible, they've won? It pains me to hear you put it like that. Like that. This is a recipe for per perpetual war. Don't you realize that the only victory is the achievement of peace between our two peoples? How it saddens me to see that the only relations between you are those of master and slave, one of exploitation, hatred, seizing every opportunity to destroy each other, and yet 
you call the denial of Palestinians their victory? Just think how much time Israel has s wasted learning the tricks of interrogation, repression, and other coercive ways to control the Palestinian population under their rule. Of course, they have had the best masters to teach them, the English, the British, who uh, left them with their perpetual, their brutal methods of torture, house demolitions, and de de deportation, uh, all enshrined in laws, such as the defense emergency regulations, which Israel found ready and used extensively over the years. True, they've managed to control the Palestinians, and in the process incarcerated many thousands who ended up despising Israel more than ever and determined to keep fighting it. But then the two nations are now further apart than ever. Had, has any of this brought peace any closer? And I reply, of course not. Yet still, the fact is that they won. To them, it's a war to destroy the Palestinians, to deny their existence their, and their rights to the land. And they did it. They won. And that's all that matters to them. As to the cost, it was much, much higher for us than for them. Nothing to compare. They lost thousands of soldiers. We lost many more and still remain stateless. Then he tells me, the cost they, go, they bore goes far beyond the number of dead in the course of numerous wars they waged. Loss of life was only part of it. How much better things would have been, would have turned out, had they used their resource, uh, superior skills and resources to help develop the region rather than continually destroying it. That's their choice, I say, a choice they make, could make because they won. And he says, the only real victory is when we both won. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Shahad. We really appreciate everything that you've told us about your experience. Um, you know, I've studied a lot of international law as well, and I was wondering what your personal reasons were for, you know, referring to the military security apparatus currently as an occupation as opposed to apartheid, giving the de jure and de facto, um, you know, elements of what's happening in, in Palestine right now. Why I refer to? Why don't you refer to it as an apartheid? Well, apartheid is, is, is a description, but uh, the the actual uh, changes in the law, which are illegal, which have mm -hmm. to be reversed in order to return to the way things are, uh, is, is a legal question that has to be addressed, and uh, you, you one doesn't address it by a slogan like apartheid. Okay, so, sorry. So, so you're saying that. Uh, the question of occupation has to be addressed, or? The occupation has to end. Okay, so you don't believe that the occupation can exist within the apartheid, the de jure and de facto apartheid? No, no, the occupation has uh, resulted in apartheid. Okay, that's, that's I, I see. You're saying like it's, a, it's transformed into? Yeah. Okay, I understand, thank you. Thank you very much. I was wondering if you could talk more about your father's struggles with the PLO and others when he was trying to come up with that early version of a two-state solution. Uh, my father, when he, I, my father, when he uh, proposed the Palestinian state, was attacked very much, and uh, the attacks were uh, that this is treason and this is not uh, acceptable. And he wrote in 1970 
uh, an article in the local paper called History Repeats. History. In 1970, he wrote a paper uh, in the local paper, an article which he called uh, History Repeats Itself. And in it, he argued that uh, uh, the military uh, struggle was uh, not going to bring any results because the most that can it can bring, uh, because it, uh, it cannot destroy Israel because the uh, Soviet Union and the American, uh, Americans are going to not allow Israel to be destroyed. And so what's the use of uh, the most that can be done is uh, to, to get, uh, uh, to, to, to give a, a permission or excuse for the world to withdraw them themselves from the uh, question and say, well, as long as the Palestinians are uh, fighting uh, for themselves, then, then we would not use politics. And he thought that politics is the only way and by negotiations that we could get anywhere. And he also thought that Israel had, uh, in, in 19, uh, after 1948, changed the country that the Palestinians left into, and made it into uh, uh, Israel. And they would do the same in the occupied territories and, and uh, time is not in our favor, because in time they would create facts and then they would say, th these are the facts and you have to abide by them. Mm -hmm. So he was exactly s uh, saying what has happened after uh, all these years. Uh, Raja, I remember uh, you had a little uh, picture uh, on the wall. I don't know if it was a picture of yourself or your father, under which you wrote, uh, "The father is the, uh, the son is the child of the father." Uh, the parallels that you have uh, drawn in your book between the approach of uh, Rahmat Aziz Shahade and yourself, his approach and your approach, and the parallels and the contrast between them uh, are, are, are very telling, obviously. My question is, we are now approaching yet another generation. Uh, your father's generation, your generation and mine, and now there's a new generation that's coming up in Palestine. How do you see that generation responding to the same challenges, to the same issues, to the same oppression, to the same injustices, and to the same struggle that doesn't seem to be moving uh, at all forward? They have a hard time because it's, uh, it's already very complicated and very uh, much advanced in, in, in the... Uh, colonial, colonial uh, aspects of the thing. Uh, of course, th th their means for fighting are different. They have now the International Criminal Court, which is a possibility, and they are doing that, and they're doing their best to get uh, the uh, case heard before the crim criminal court. And, and Haq, as you know, is, is very involved with this. And they have also great means with the social media and with the uh, uh, new uh, possibilities for informing people to uh, uh, expose Israel and, and change the public opinion, which I think is beginning to happen, certainly in this country and certainly in, in Europe. And, and that would make a big difference, such as explaining that the, uh, Israel is an apartheid state and, and therefore uh, it should not be tolerated as such and, and so on. And, and that, that is a new way of struggle which uh, young people, younger people than us, are, are involved in and they have done some tremendously good work, I think, so far. But it's a long battle, and, and none, of the, none of these tactics are going to bring immediate results. They're going to take a long time. Thank you. 